So this morning, we are going to continue with our lecture on gametogenesis. You remember we started on gametogenesis and uh, we did uh, spermatogenesis. So today we'll pick from oogenesis. Just to remind you that uh, gametogenesis takes place in four key phases. The first phase is where the gamete stem cells originate from extra gonadocytes and invade the indifferent gonad prenatally. And then they become the stem cells for the gametes, either ugonia or spermatogonia. The second phase involves numerical increase in the number of the gametes, and this is done by mitosis. The third phase is establishment of the haploidy, and this is done by meiotic division. And then the, la <clears throat> the last phase is the differentiation phase, which involves both morphologic and functional maturation of the gametes. The way the sperm goes through phase two, three, and four is very different from the way the oocyte goes through phase three and four. And so we had already talked about that concerning the sperm. So now let's talk about that concerning the oocyte. So we'll go direct to oogenesis. Oogenesis takes place within the ovarian cortex. This is the ovary. This outer zone of the ovary is what you call the ovarian cortex. And this central zone of the ovary is what you call the ovarian medulla. So oogenesis takes place within the ovarian cortex where we see those follicles at different stages of maturation. Unlike spermatogenesis, the process of mitotic division and even meiotic division to form the oocyte begin before the girl child is born. In contrast, remember that spermatogenesis, this process was starting at the age of puberty. However, because the meiosis is arrested in oogenesis, it takes very long to form a single oocyte indeed. Yes, meiosis will begin even before the girl child is born, but to be arrested at some point as we're going to see, only later to be completed after puberty, but again, according to the monthly cycles, so that uh, every month there are a few that are stimulated to continue during the reproductive years of a woman. Again, that process will not go on forever. It will have to end at some point and it ends at menopause. We can work with the age of 49 plus minus a few. So it takes very long to form a single oocyte if you think about it in that context. Yes, meiosis began before birth, but it becomes arrested at some point and that can only be undone during the reproductive years of a woman, every month, a few uh, proceed to continue with development. Some don't continue, they still remain. So that those that will mature at the age of 15, there's those that will mature at the age of 45, for example, it takes variable number of years to form a single oocyte. The cells which surround the oocyte, are known as the follicular cells and the granulosa cells. There's a slight difference in terms of the terminology when we call them granulosa and when we call them follicular. And let me just clarify that here. As the oocyte develops, it is surrounded by increasing number of the supporting cells. So to your left, you see an oocyte that's surrounded by just one layer of supporting cells. 
and those supporting cells are even squamous in shape. And to your right, you see an oocyte that's around by several supporting cells with even a cavity. This one, several supporting cells, there is no cavity. We are going to give the names to these structures shortly. But for now, I want you to capture that the oocyte is surrounded by increasing number of supporting cells as it grows. And especially during the maturation phases, of the oocytes during the reproductive years of a woman. So this oocyte surrounded by the squamous cells, these squamous supporting cells are the ones we call the follicular cells. And these cuboidal cells are the ones we call the granulosa cells. Well, it's not a strict terminology, but we prefer using the term granulosa when they are cuboidal and uh, follicular when they are squamous. Some people prefer using the term follicular also when it's just one layer of cells. Then when it's multiple layers, we prefer using the term granulosa. Not so strict though. Importantly, I want you to note that uh, the oocyte is surrounded by a glycoprotein covering that separates it from the supporting cells. That glycoprotein covering is actually secreted by both the oocyte as well as the supporting cells. We call that glycoprotein covering the zona pellucida. The zona pellucida is an important structure as we're going to see later when you talk about fertilization. Now, this complex that is made up of the oocyte, the supporting cells, and the zona pellucida is what we otherwise call the ovarian follicle. So that's an ovarian follicle. This is an ovarian follicle. This is an ovarian follicle and that's an ovarian follicle at different stages of maturation. And we'll be revisiting these stages of maturation of the follicle to give terminologies to the different types of follicles that we have. So for now, I want you to understand that the oocyte is surrounded by growing number of follicular cells. As the oocyte matures, the number of follicular cells around it also increase but we still call that whole complex, the graphian, sorry, the ovarian follicle. We call that the ovarian follicle. Right, so let's now go step by step on to the specific stages that the oocyte undergoes during oogenesis. We talked about the fact that uh, primordial germ cells migrate from the wall of the yolk sac to the indifferent gonad. And that happened prenatally. And we said that that time the indifferent gonad does not know whether to become a testis or an ovary. If by chance then, well not chance, it's determined. If the indifferent gonad differentiates into the ovary, then the primordial germ cells, which have invaded that particular gonad, will become the stem cells of forming the oocyte, which we call the oogonia. So oogonia is now present within the indifferent gonad, or rather within now the oos, within now the ovary of this particular fetus. Oogonia are the stem cells of forming the oocyte. Once the ugonia are there, or once this indifferent gonad has committed to become the ovary, and so we have ugonia inside it, the ugonia immediately begins the process of mitosis. So, I want you to remember this is actually happening before the girl child is born. 
the Ugonia begin mitotic division. Remember that was phase two of gametogenesis. It involves several series of mitosis, as we talked about it last time. And eventually the cells that we do have will be called primary oocytes. Remember it's mitotic division. So those primary oocytes are still, the primary oocytes are still diploid cells. They're not haploid cells. Right, so that is what we expect to happen. And that is actually what happens. The Ugonia undergo mitotic division. Several series of mitotic division will give us an exponential increase in the number of the primary oocytes. And the total number of primary oocytes that uh, will be present in the fetal ovary is about 7 million of them. Well, I'm saying that's the maximum. It can also be 5 million or six, not a big deal, but usually not beyond 7 million, roughly there. So the Ugonia has undergone phase two of gametogenesis, numerical increase in the number of the gametes. Now let's see how it undergoes phase three. And this is where the story is a bit complicated. The primary oocytes, which are diploid cells, need to establish haploidy. Establishment of haploidy says to it that the cells need to undergo meiotic division. Meiosis is in two stages or two phases. We have meiosis one and meiosis two. So we'd expect the primary oocytes to undergo the first meiotic division to give us two daughter cells. Those two daughter cells, which the primary oocytes will give us after the first meiotic division are not necessarily of equal size. This is because during oogenesis, the meiotic division is unequal. The cells don't share the same amount of cytoplasm. Is a cell that will go with most of the cytoplasm. And that cell is the cell that we're talking about. If it is first meiotic division, that cell will be the sec called the secondary oocyte because it's coming from the primary oocyte. But as a concept, whether it's meiosis one or meiosis two, the cytoplasmic division is unequal. And so there'll be one viable cell, the one with a lot of cytoplasm, and there's, there'll be one cell that is not viable. The cell that's not viable is termed the polar body. The polar body has hardly any cytoplasm. So if it's a polar, polar body formed from the first metric division, then we call it the first polar body. If it's a polar body formed from the second meiotic division, then we call it the second polar body. So in this case, because we are talking about the first meiotic division, the primary oocyte will give us the secondary oocyte and the first polar body. Then perhaps in the next stage, the secondary oocyte will undergo the second meiotic division to give us mature ovum and the second polar body. I'm not saying these things have happened. I'm saying this is what is expected to happen. So if the primary oocyte successfully go through the first metric division, that is the result that we'll get. We'll get a secondary oocyte and the first polar body. Now let's see. If you remember how mitosis was done, there's some stages, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We borrow same terminologies when you're talking about meiosis, except you need to put something to indicate whether it's first meiotic division or second meiotic division. So for meiosis one, we talk of prophase one, metaphase one, anaphase one, and telophase one. 
the primary oocytes begin prophase one of the first metric division. And the, these primary oocytes begin prophase one before the girl child is born. Again, remember that all this thing is happening prenatally. The primary oocyte begin the first metric division before the girl child is born. However, when it enters the first uh, prophase, that is when it enters prophase one stage of cell division, the primary oocyte becomes arrested at that point. We call that the first meiotic arrest. We are calling it first because there'll be a second one that we'll be talking about. So point to note is this, that the primary oocyte becomes arrested at prophase one of the first meiotic division. And this arrest occurs prenatally. The first meiotic arrest of the oocyte occurs at prophase one of cell division prenatally. The arrest of the primary oocyte at prophase one is facilitated by a particular hormone which come from the follicular cells. We call that hormone the oocyte maturation inhibitor. So the hormone oocyte maturation inhibitor, OMI, is the one that is secreted by the supporting cells of the oocyte. And that hormone is the one that inhibits the primary oocytes at prophase one so that it does not continue in the process of meiotic division. Prophase one arrest lasts for a very long time. We give it in years. And that has implications then. It means that that girl shall be born. All the eggs in her ovary have been arrested at prophase one. So here I want you to note, we are no longer talking about the Ugonia anymore. We have the primary oocytes. All the cells in her ovary are primary oocytes at prophase one, all of them. This girl shell will grow until the age of puberty. Still, all the eggs in her ovary will be primary oocytes arrested at prophase one of cell division. I'll be saying something about the number of the primary oocytes, how they change as the girl grows later in one of the slides. But let's try to imagine a success story. So this is the normal success story. When this girl reaches puberty, the eggs in her ovary are primary oocytes at prophase one of cell division. Now, puberty means that now the girl starts the reproductive maturity. When the age of reproductive maturity reaches, and so the girl child starts to experience the cycles that we know about women. Every month, a few of the follicles, I now know that you are familiar with the term follicle, a few of the follicles become recruited to continue in development. So the number of follicles which are recruited every month is not just one, but about 15 to 20 follicles are recruited now to continue in their development. I'm using the term surviving here because as you're going to see by the time this girl shall reach puberty, we no longer have those 7 million cells that you're talking about. We have much less. So the much less that is still remaining, 15 to 20 are recruited to continue in the development with each menstrual cycle. 
And so that will characterize perhaps the first phase of the female reproductive cycles when the egg is being produced until the time of ovulation. And then from ovulation, another story we'll talk about. So let's imagine a success in this particular month that 15 to 20 have been recruited. The ones which are recruited will continue in their cell division. So they'll enter metaphase one and then anaphase one and finally telophase one. After telophase one, we are going to have two daughter cells. One with a large cytoplasm called the secondary oocyte, and one with hardly any cytoplasm called the first polar body. So we can only have this secondary oocyte and first polar body after the age of puberty or during puberty period. Even though I know we mentioned it earlier, remember there has been a prophase one arrest. And remember, this only applies to the ones which are successful in being recruited to continue the process. So just to highlight something, to make you remember something, we are comparing meiotic division in, during gametogenesis. We are comparing what we see in spermatogenesis to your right, and what you see in eugenesis to your left. So this is meiotic division in gametogenesis. In spermatogenesis, the primary spermatocyte divides into two during the first meiotic division to give us two secondary spermatocytes, which are fairly of equal sizes, so they're both viable. The secondary spermatocytes also enter the second meiotic division to give us two daughter cells each, which we call spermatids, and they are all viable, which means that one primary spermatocyte then gives us four spermatids. All are viable. And this is because the cytoplasmic division is relatively equal. So all cells are viable. That's different from oogenesis, where the primary oocyte undergoes the first meiotic division, but it's an equal cytoplasmic division. So the secondary oocyte is having a lot of cytoplasm, but the first polar body has hardly any cytoplasm. As you are going to see, the secondary oocyte will also undergo the second meiotic division to give us the mature oocyte and the second polar body again. And so that begs the question, what is the role of a polar body? So maybe that will be my first question I'm asking you. What is the role of a polar body? Okay, your mic is muted because there's some noise in the background, but uh, if you know the answer, you can put up your hand and I'll enable your mic. What do you think is the role of a polar body? Anyone? Okay, nobody has an idea. So from what I've told you, if we are having meiotic division, remember one of the roles of meiotic division is to establish haploidy. And this means that uh, we are basically reducing the number of chromosomes or we are dividing into two the genetic material. We want to reduce the genetic content. So the role of a polar body is to get rid of the excess genetic material to get rid of the unwanted genetic material. It gets rid of the extra genome. Okay, 
we are at secondary oocyte. The secondary oocyte is now a haploid cell. The other chromosomal set has gone away with the first polar body. The secondary oocyte begins the second metric division almost immediately. Remember the aim of the secondary oocyte is to give us mature ovum and the second polar body if this process becomes successful. So it begins the second metric division almost immediately after it has been formed. And remember this is happening all within the first half of the female reproductive cycle. From the time the arrest at Profess One was undone, all these events are taking place within the first half of the female reproductive cycle when the egg is now being formed, or let me say maturing. So the secondary oocyte begins the second meiotic division. It will enter into prophase two and then go to metaphase two. When the secondary oocyte reaches metaphase two, another arrest takes place. We call that the second meiotic arrest. The second meiotic arrest of the oocyte involve arrest of the secondary oocyte. And the secondary oocyte becomes arrested at metaphase two. This arrest takes place just before ovulation. We commonly say about three hours before ovulation, the second meiotic arrest takes place, which means what? that the oocyte that a woman ovulates has actually not completed the second meiotic division. It has not completed meiosis. It has secondary oocyte that's being ovulated because that ovulation occurs three hours after this arrest. So the oocyte is still at metaphase two of cell division. Did you know that the oocyte never completes the second meiotic division? That the story usually ends there many times. Why? Because the second meiotic division can only be completed on one condition, that the secondary oocyte is visited by a sperm. So unless the secondary oocyte is fertilized by a sperm, it never completes its second meiotic division. Meiosis, or rather, oogenesis usually end there for that particular cell at metaphase two. But if it becomes fertilized by a sperm, then we are good to go. The secondary oocyte will enter into anaphase two and then go into telophase two and become the mature ovum and the second polar body. But if that does not happen, we will not have that mature ovum and we will not have the second polar body. Great, so that is oogenesis. Remember that two meiotic arrests. So just to remind you about what I told you about the oocyte as it grows. So perhaps this is what we have at the beginning when the, it's being recruited. The 15 to 20 which are being recruited would be looking like this. But as they mature, they continue to be like this. The one that is about to be related will be looking close to this one. So these are different stages of maturation of the ovarian follicle. Remember I told you that there's a zona pellucida that surround the oocyte, separating it from the supporting cells. The whole thing is called the ovarian follicle, which are at different stages of maturation. This maturation event takes place during the first half of the female reproductive cycle. So from here up to around there, if this woman has a 28 day cycle, then it means that this will take about 14 days. 
On that note, I want us to talk about the types of ovarian follicles and follow with me here. So, sorry, the image you're seeing is a histology slide of an ovary. Ovary has the outer zone called the ovarian cortex, where you see the different follicles. Then it has this central zone, which we call the ovarian medulla. The ovarian medulla largely contains connective tissue like that region I'm pointing, and uh, blood vessels like these ones. Remember the follicles are in the cortex. So this is a magnified image of the ovarian cortex to show you that that's where the follicles are. Down here is the ovarian medulla, which contain connective tissue and blood vessels. Now look at that part there. This one here is another connective tissue which covers the ovary. We call it the ovarian capsule. So that's the ovarian capsule. It may go by the name tunica albuginea, the thick covering of the ovary. Now, the intention of this slide is for us to learn the ovarian follicles. There are different types of ovarian follicles. The most primitive of the ovarian follicles are called primordial follicles. And this is how they look like. The primordial follicles consist of one primary oocyte and surrounding one layer of squamous cells. So yes, there is an oocyte there, but look at the supporting cells which surround the oocyte. It's just a thin layer. So it's basically one layer and they're squamous cell. That's why you don't see them being prominent. So that cell that's surrounded by one layer of squamous cells, which means surrounded by follicular cells, the squamous follicular cells, that is what we call the primordial follicle. What do we note about primordial follicles? They exist in groups. As you can see them here, they're just in many groups. There are also subcapsular. This is the ovarian capsule. So they're just beneath the capsule of the ovary, they're subcapsular. Okay. These are the ones that are recruited in cycles every month. We don't know the basis of follicular selection, like what determines whether this is the one that become recruited or not the other one. We really don't know that clear. But somehow there are some mechanisms that guide follicular selection so that only 15 to 20 become recruited and not everything become recruited. Anyway, the ones that become recruited will grow to become what we call primary follicles. How does a primary follicle look like? Primary follicle will be something like this one here. Of important to note is that it's surrounded now by cuboidal cells instead of the squamous cells. That's the most fundamental difference. Of course, we can also see differences in size as well. We can also see that these ones are now further away from the capsule. And we can also appreciate that these ones are not necessarily existing in groups. So all these are primary ovarian follicles. There are different types of primary ovarian follicles. There are those that are surrounded by one layer of cuboidal cells. So we call them unilamina primary ovarian follicles. But there are those as stimulation continues, the number of the granulosa cells layers increase so that they'll now no longer be surrounded by just one layer of supporting cells, but more than one layer of supporting cells. When they have more than one layer of supporting cells, 
then we prefer calling them multilamina primary ovarian follicles. And perhaps these two could belong to that category of multilamina. And then this one and that one perhaps belong to the category of unilamina. Maybe a better one to show us the multilamina primary ovarian follicle with this one. We appreciate that the number of layers of the granulosa cells have increased in this one. Okay, when this one continue to grow, remember it's a maturation process. When this one matures, the number of supporting cells will increase, but something else also happens. A cavity appears. When that cavity appears within the group of supporting cells, we call this one the antral follicle. It simply means it has an antrum. So we call it the antral follicle. The antral follicle could be many. There could be many types of antral follicles at different stages of maturation as well. Look at this one. Look at that one, the antrum is just forming. This one has formed, but uh, still very small. This one has a large cavity. So again, you may have different sizes and maturation stages of the antral follicles. We sometimes call them secondary follicles. The antral follicle may be called the secondary follicle. So as they mature, the size of the antrum increases. As we approach ovulation, the one that is eminent for ovulation will be moving towards the ovarian capsule again. That particular antral follicle that moves towards the ovarian capsule for eminent ovulation is the one we call the mature follicle. And so this is a mature follicle. It has reached the surface of the ovarian capsule. Of important is that it has this thing here that is protruding on the surface. This is what we call the stigma. The antral follicle that has a stigma is the one we call the mature follicle or otherwise known as the graphian follicle. So the graphian follicle is the mature follicle. It refers to the antral follicle that is most dominant and is the one that is eminent for ovulation. So it is just near the ovarian capsule there. Those are the different types of uh, ovarian follicles. Let's say something about the number of ovarian follicles as growth continues. At the beginning, we said that we had so many ovarian follicles. We mentioned about 7 million ovarian follicles, or at least about 7 million primary oocytes. The number of ovarian follicles usually reduce significantly before birth and even after birth of the girl. The process of reduction of the follicles is called follicular atresia. It simply means that they degenerate. So we said at the beginning we had about 7 million. Surprisingly, by the time the girl child was being born, the girl child was having less than 1 million Everent follicles in her ovary. A significant reduction in the number of ovarian follicles. Many ovarian follicles undergo atresia before birth. Now, the story doesn't end there. Remember, she needs to grow from birth until puberty. By the time the girl child reaches puberty, again, we are surprised the number of ovarian follicles which are viable in her ovary are less than 50,000 from that possible slightly less than 1 million. Now they're only less than 50,000. 
that sounds like an ouch, it's a lot, but uh, a lot that are disappearing. Are we risking infertility? Not quite, because look, you don't think of a woman having 40,000 children anyway. Uh -huh. We've mentioned that the less than 50,000 which are present at the beginning of puberty, they'll be recruited every month about 15 to 20. But what do we know? Not all those usually mature to be ovulated. In most cases, only one that will mature then become ovulated. Sometimes a few are the ones which mature become ovulated. What happens to the others? They also undergo follicular atresia. So we see the journey is quite tough also for the oocytes. The same way it was, we'll see it's a bit tough also for the sperms. Don't worry much about the numbers because anyway, how many does a woman need? If you assume this woman is going to ovulate every month in all the months of her reproductive years and let's be generous, let's say she starts at age 10 and finish at age 50, that means she has 40 years of ovulation, 12 times in a year, that will still be less than 500. So she just needs about 500 if you look at it. So the numbers reduce, but they're still adequate for what purpose we have for it. Great. Let's name parts of the antrophollicle. So this one labeled one is the oocyte. This one labeled two is the zona pellucida. The one level three, four, and five represent the population of the granulosa cells which surround the oocyte. But the granulosa cell populations exist in three categories. The population of granulosa cells immediately outside the zona pellucida, level three, are termed the corona radiata. The population of granulosa cells that suspend the oocyte, the one labeled four, are termed the cumulus euphorus. And the population of granulosa cells that are external to the antrum, so the ones labeled five, the antrum is six, the ones labeled five constitute what we call the stratum granulosum. Of course, six is the follicular antrum, the cavity that has fluid. External to the stratum granulosum are some cells of the ovarian stroma that surround the follicle. The cells of the ovarian stroma that surround the follicle constitute what we call the thicker folliculi. When, when ovulation takes place, this is the only thing that is ovulated, what I am encycling. That is what is ovulated. When this thing matures and becomes a graphene follicle, this is what will be ovulated. The rest remain in the ovary to become what we call the corpus luteum. So here, this is what will be ovulated, which is this one the oocyte together with the zona pellucida and corona radiata. Then this other one remain in the ovary, which means the stratum granulosum remain in the ovary and also the thicker folliculi also remain in the ovary. The stratum granulosum and the thicker follicle that remain in the ovary constitute what we call the corpus luteum. So what is corpus luteum? It refers to the remnants of the mature follicle after ovulation. 
having said so, during ovulation, there's a hormone that is released to facilitate the process of ovulation. We call that luteinizing hormone. When luteinizing hormone is being released, it's usually released in form of a surge, and that luteinizing hormone causes luteinization of the ovarian follicle. So if the ovarian follicle undergoes luteinization, the cells of the follicle that will be affected, the ones that remain are the stratum granulosum. When they undergo luteinization, they become what you call the granulosa lutein cells. The other cells that will be affected are the thicker folliculi, and those ones become what we call the thicker lutein cells. So the cells of the corpus luteum are granulosa lutein cells and the thicker lutein cells. These cells are responsible for production of hormones after ovulation. So they have endocrine function. Right, so that summarizes the story of oogenesis for you. That is how oogenesis takes place. I want to give you a chance to ask a few questions, but also and to give you a chance to discuss the differences between spermatogenesis and oogenesis. All right.